Hi, and welcome to Glint Meets. Uh, this week, Glint Meets Graham Rowan from Beaufort Private Equity. I'm Jason Cousins, the founder and CEO of Glint. Uh, but first, before we get started, uh, Graham, do you think you could just give us your backstory and uh, and how how Beaufort Private Equity helps uh, investors and entrepreneurs? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. So, so thanks for uh, having me on, Jason. Um, yeah, I've been personally working with high net worth investors for over a decade now. And the way we run Beaufort is kind of a private members club. And we've got over 700 members across 37 different countries now. Um, and we really help them to find interesting alternative investments in two main asset classes. One is uh, private equity, where we look for uh, high growth companies, where we think we're going to get some significant capital growth over the next three or four or five years. And the other is private debt, where we're talking about bonds and loan notes that are well secured, but give a, a real above inflation return so that people can actually make a a positive income, unlike what they get from their bank accounts and all the other uh, government bonds and so on out there at the moment. So uh, for our investment partners, the companies that we raise funds for, um, we try and become really kind of close to them. And we work with them over a series of raises, often over several years. Um, and it, it really does become like a sort of a, a family. And I think you experienced some of that when you came to our recent live event in London. Um, and, you know, it's not just a case of we raise the money and, and say goodbye we try and have a long-term partnership and we we go on that journey with our partners so it's uh it's really exciting and it, it keeps me out of mischief yeah and i did come to your recent london event in fact you asked me some questions on stage it was great and what i really loved about the event actually was the kind of sense of community that was with the uh, investor you know community group that you've got there i could see a lot of interesting conversations going on between them sharing views perspectives and strategies etc but uh you you kind of uh created a perfect pivot because you said you know alternative to what's offered by the banks etc wow i mean this week bank runs bailouts rescues I mean, um, for people coming into this uh, maybe a bit late, uh, can you take us through what just happened this week? Wow. I mean, how long have you got? This is starting to feel like 2008 <laughs> all over again, isn't it? You know, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it began with the uh, the very sort of woke and cool Silicon Valley bank over there in America. And then it spread to some other American banks and then it spread to Europe. Um, gosh, I mean, each one in a way you can see almost a separate story. I think with Silicon Valley Bank, what's happened is really a result of the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, they, they went through this process of generating all this new currency during the pandemic. Um, and then, first of all, denying there was going to be inflation, then saying it was transitory, and then finally, belatedly, responding by increasing interest rates further and faster than they ever have before in their 110-year history. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Well, what happened is Silicon Valley Bank bought a whole load of treasuries with the money that they had on their balance sheet in the days when interest rates were really low. And the more the interest rates go up, the more the value of those old bonds, which are locked into the lower interest rates, goes down. So effectively, the losses on their balance sheet meant that their equity disappeared, which started a bank run and eventually led to the, the, the bank basically going out of business. So that one, I think, very much was down to a, a combination of the Fed's rate hikes, but also some really poor risk management within the bank, who should have had much shorter term uh, treasuries in their balance sheet instead of the long-term ones that have caused all these problems. So it's it's a mixture of things that are happening, but it, it, it the fear obviously is contagion. Will this spread? And yes, we've seen all bank shares going down in the last seven days, and it spread to Europe. And the weakest link in Europe was, of course, Credit Suisse, the second biggest bank in Switzerland. And what happened there was that they were already in a bit of trouble. And one of their biggest investors in Saudi Arabia said, We've had enough. We're not putting any more money in. And that was kind of the alarm bell that really triggered uh, the beginning of the end for them. 
And again, we've had one of these very strange things happening over the weekend where shareholders in Credit Suisse went to bed on Friday thinking their bank was worth about nine and a half billion euros. They wake up on Monday morning to find it's been sold to one of its biggest competitors, UBS, for something like three billion. And they've not been consulted and they've had their shareholdings wiped out. So uh, these are challenging times for uh, investors and, and worrying times for the global financial system. Yeah. And um, and of course, it's these treasuries that actually the central banks and the regulators do encourage banks to to buy effectively encourage the banks to lend them the money that the depositors have put in their banks. Uh, and of course, this is coming back to bite them um, with the policy of the central banks, of course, you know, uh, you know, these banks don't know what the central bank's going to do next quarter or next month. So it's 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 kind of not fair in a, to a degree to blame it all on the banks. I think, uh, as you say, this this aggressive interest rate hiking um, is is unprecedented in its speed that it's it's gone up in. It's not just the banks, of course, that are going to have problems with those interest rates going up. It's also businesses and individuals. But I did read um, this morning uh, an article that quoted a, a chap called Brown. Brad Klontz, who's a certified financial planner and financial psychology professor at Creighton University. And he seemed to be blaming it on the depositors. I mean, he said, he said, quote, um, like a mass delusion that became a reality. Um, and and yet somehow I kind of think that uh, actually it's the it's a there's another delusion which central banks and the banking community foster, which is that which is partly to blame, which is this which is this delusional belief that your money in the bank is totally 100 percent safe. I mean, um, isn't this more to do with the fundamental risk that exists within banks? I mean, aren't they you know how they're actually designed to operate? Well, I think there are almost three distinct elements to that uh, discussion, Jason. I think, firstly, what I've learned again during this process is that these technocrats like Jerome Powell in America and Andrew Bailey in the Bank of England genuinely think that they are in control and that this is all a well-oiled machine and they can pull all the levers and control it uh, at their will. That is such total BS. They are utterly out of control and they're always a day late and many dollars short. So they are not controlling the system. They're always reacting to the latest crisis, oftentimes a crisis that they themselves have contributed to. So they are massively to blame for some of these problems. The second issue is you know, the banks themselves. We've seen some truly awful examples of risk management. We've had all this long running debate about you know investment banking versus retail banking. Should they be separated? Should the uh, you know, all the people who use a bank be subject to the whims of the casino betting that goes on in the investment bank? So there's also some culpability with the banks. And what always amazes me, and it's come out again during this process, is how many people don't understand the fundamentals of how the banking system works. So in that sense, his comments about the depositors and perhaps their naivety is somewhat true because People don't realize when you put your money in the bank, it's no longer your money. You are a creditor of the bank. And when something like this happens, and this is where we can get into a discussion perhaps about the FDIC and its equivalent over in the UK, the FSCS, they are apparently, allegedly insured these deposits that you put in the bank up to a certain limit. But you are relying then on effectively politicians and central bankers to come to your rescue, because there's also this whole thing that's been quietly put in place since 2008, which is the idea of bail-ins rather than bail-outs. Because you remember all the fury back then when we as taxpayers had to foot the bill and people talked about you know privatized profits and socialized losses. Well, what they're trying to do this time is to pretend that it won't be taxpayers payers paying the bill. But again, that is complete BS because what happens with these insurance schemes is that they are funded by the banks and the financial institutions. And if they suddenly have to pay a lot more into those schemes to cover the rescues that we've seen in the last week or so, they're going to pass those costs on to their customers, which is you and I, the average Joe, 
banking clients. So one way or another, we will end up paying for these rescues. And so, yeah, we are somewhat naive to put too much money into banks. We kind of, I think some people, most people perhaps are, are aware of the 85,000 limit in Britain. It's a quarter of a million in America. Um, so you've always got to spread your money between multiple accounts. Uh, but even then, look how vulnerable you are to potential bank failures and also to the whims of who's going to decide whether your bank and your deposits get rescued or whether you have to convert your deposits into a shareholding in the bank. And we've just seen from Credit Suisse how flaky that can be. So this should raise questions in every individual and every company's mind about just how safe their money is in the bank. Yeah, I think there's definitely uh, a feeling has been fostered uh, since the 2008 crisis that basically banks are too big to fail. Um, and of course, in 2008, as you said, there was a complete bailout of those banks by the governments and the shareholders. The people who taxpayers uh, effectively became shareholders in a lot of these banks. And I think we're still, you know, f feeling the losses that were on some of those buyouts. But you know this this whole thing about um non-insured deposits and in individuals and businesses i think you're right there's people need to be very clear that strictly speaking there is an insurance up to say eighty five thousand pounds in the uk up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the us but of course you can't blame people to a degree for thinking though you know it's going to be a bailout because there's always been it's always been a bailout and you even get biden getting up and and, and saying don't worry the bank's fine banking system's fine we'll do whatever it takes kind of thing to to back that out but of course they wouldn't have passed these bail-in legislations would they if they weren't going to use them um and they did use them in cyprus i think uh, when the cyprus crisis happened over there so they they tried it all out and the world didn't come to the end so it worked and of course i found it interesting how this time round you know there's been HSBC buying uh, Silicon Valley Bank UK. We now have UBS buying uh, C Credit Suisse. And you just kind of wonder what the conversations behind the scenes are like, you know, in Switzerland and, and in the UK there when these when the decision about what's going to happen is discussed between the banks and the central banks and the government. Well, yes. And also there, there was a, a very brief announcement by the Fed over the weekend that they are working with a bunch of other central banks, including uh, Japan and uh, I think the UK and Switzerland, to increase liquidity in the system. Because one of the problems that comes out of all of these banking crises is a liquidity crunch. And that's what would stop the whole financial system working. So again, quietly behind the scenes over the weekend, the Fed has been making billions and billions and billions of dollars available. And of course, what they've even done, just just weeks after Jerome Powell said, oh, don't worry, we have all the tools we need to control inflation and to bring everything neatly back down to the 2% targets and so on. He goes and creates a new tool last week. What's it called? It's called the Bank Term Funding Program. This is a $600 billion program created overnight with no dialogue with Congress or the White House. And effectively, what they're doing is they're saying, OK, we will underwrite those bonds that you bought at the old price. We'll give you the price you paid for them rather than the market price they're now at because we've hiked the rates up so much. I mean, if you and I ran our businesses like this, we'd be in jail. You know, this is this is just fraudulent stuff going on. And yet it just happens overnight. So they wouldn't be doing things like this if there was no crisis underlying the system. So the question for us is, what can we do about that? And I think even just saying spreading your money across different banks is probably not enough. We have to look at other ways in which we can hold our liquid resources that are going to be more resilient in what could prove to be uh, another financial crisis, at least on the scale, if not bigger than 2008, because let's face it, the world's amount of debt has massively increased since then. And although the banks are somewhat better capitalized you can't really sit back complacently and say everything must be okay with what we've seen in the last seven days so you know let's not believe everything we're being told by these technocrats there's clearly a problem and we've got to look at what else we can do with our money to address that problem and keep ourselves safe 
So let's let's just deal with that. I mean, obviously, as you said, spreading money across different bank accounts is is one solution. Um, and uh, I suppose when you're doing that, you've got to be careful that you're not putting into a bank into banks that are owned by the same parent, because of course that wouldn't help. What things can people do? Well, I mean, I think one of the concepts I talk to to Beaufort members about a lot is 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 private money, by which I mean money that is beyond the control of politicians and central banks so that they can't debase it, they can't inflate it away. Uh, and also, if we look ahead to things like central bank digital currencies, they can't gain complete control of your finances and your life. So really, the, 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 the two obvious examples, I guess, are Bitcoin and gold. Now, the problem with Bitcoin is it's proved to be too volatile in its pricing to be effective as a store of value. And it's also not a very easy thing to use as a medium of exchange. You can't really go into many uh, vendors, many retail shops, many cafes or restaurants and pay with Bitcoin. So that brings us to gold. Now, gold has thousands of years of track record as a store of value. So it gets a huge tick in that box. And until recently, I've been recommending to our members that they buy things like gold Britannia coins uh, because they are legal tender currency. And so you wouldn't pay any capital gains tax on them when the gold price inevitably goes up hugely, as I believe it will across this decade. But, you know, again, you go into Starbucks with a gold Britannia, you buy an Americano for £2.50 and you say, have you got change of £1,647, mate? And you'll get a bit of a funny look from the barista. <laughs> so what you guys have done with, with, with Glint, I think, is really important here because now... I can get my MasterCard out and through the, the Glint app, I can effectively sell £2.50 worth of gold in my Brinks uh, vault over there in Zurich and immediately get it converted to sterling if I'm in Britain or dollars or euros, whatever. And I can pay that merchant and they are none the wiser. So, so what you've done is to effectively restore gold's position as a practical everyday medium of exchange. So why wouldn't I want to put my... Uh, pounds and dollars into gold and then only convert them to fiat at that point of purchase where I have to, rather than letting them just be subject to whatever the inflation rate is, 10, 12, 15%. I don't want my savings to be debased at that rate. So to me, you know, gold as private money has definitely got to be part of every uh, serious investor strategy during the 2020s. Well, we're both singing from the same hymn sheet there. And actually, it was in the last global financial crisis in 2008 that I realized that, you know, when you put your money in the bank, it ceases to be yours. I realized that for the first time. It's then that I realized that, uh, you know, there is no money in the bank. Maybe 10% of all client funds are held back just in case of withdrawal. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I set out on the journey to to create this um, bottom-up return to sound money, so to speak, giving people the ability to have their own personal gold standard because the bank, as you say, the central banks, they're not going to change the system. We're going to have to make the change for ourselves. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the compliments on that. And um, we're ob we've obviously seen a huge amount of increase in business over the last week uh, since people are kind of rushing towards this solution. But, I mean... Um, you know, there are lots of challenges that investors are facing in 2023. And you know, people are worried about in, uh, stagflation, for instance. Is that is that a likely scenario, do you think? Well, yes. I mean, th this is one of the areas where, uh, again, I would beg to differ with the kind of accepted narrative. So, for example, in the UK, which now I think has just been announced by the OECD, will have the lowest growth of anyone except Russia this year. Um, we had briefly the hope of a genuine kind of government focused on growth when Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng were around. Now, the uh, the accepted narrative is, oh, that was all disastrous. Look at what it did to gilt prices, etc. Now, yes, they moved too quickly, and yes, they could have uh, you know, handled their communications more effectively, but they were focused on growth. They were looking at investment zones, which I noticed Jeremy Hunt has copied that idea in his latest budget, but they were also looking to lower taxes. It's very hard to tax your way to growth, and Britain now has the highest taxes it's had since World War II, and there's more on the way. But it also has a massive number of people who've just given up on the whole idea of work. We've got 6 million people of working age sitting at home watching daytime TV. Uh, we've got 
36 million people now who are taking more from the government in handouts than they're paying in tax. So I don't know how you make a country work on those numbers. I certainly don't know how you make an economy grow on those numbers. And yet we're, we're living a lie at the moment. We're all living beyond our means in the Western world. Um, and no one, no politician is prepared to face this down and actually start recognizing that we need to either increase our productivity to support the way of life we want, or we have to start drawing our horns in and cutting back on government programs and government spending. So I think stagflation, yeah, that's inflation with no growth. Uh, I lived through that in the 1970s. It's not great. It's not pleasant either as a as a worker. Uh, you're constantly fighting the battle of increasing costs. And, you know, let's not forget, even these very high official inflation figures are massively manipulated. Uh, the real inflation costs most of us have experienced are more like 17 or 20 percent in the last 12 months. So, you know, it's very hard to live in that environment. It's also very hard to be an investor in that environment. But one of the things that has historically done well in a time of inflation is gold. Um, so again, I think although gold doesn't play a coupon, and that's the thing that you know people will usually, with the Warren Buffett of this world, will say against it, what it does do is avoid the 10, 15, 20% loss of purchasing power that you would have if you kept that money in cash. So effectively, it's a, a kind of a reverse coupon, if you like. The opportunity cost of keeping it in cash would be that you'd lose that amount of money. And of course, no deposit account is ever going to pay you enough to make up for that. So I think for, for investors and for businesses, they've got to look at what they do with their, their cash reserves. Um, they've got to expect a period of low growth in the UK. And that means also they have to broaden their horizons and look uh, further afield to countries that might offer greater opportunity. And we all tend to be a little bit parochial, a little bit too focused on and too overweight in investments in our home country. And one of the things that I try and encourage our members to do is to think globally, to look for other opportunities, maybe even for a second residency or citizenship in a country where there might be better prospects for you and your family, the country you were, you were born and raised in. Um, because, you know, this these challenges affect a lot of different countries. And if you're you know, really going to be smart. You've got to start thinking a decade or two ahead, maybe even a generation or two ahead as to what's the long term picture looking like. And, you know, what is the, the financial system going to look like? Are we going to have the great reset that they talk about at the World Economic Forum in Davos? Are we all going to go down this CBDC route and we'll all be digital slaves to our government masters? You know, there's a lot of issues to address here. And it above and beyond just your kind of basic return on investment so yeah these are these are interesting and challenging times which i found out the other day may you live in interesting times is a curse not a compliment and uh you talk about yields there on uh currency where where there isn't a yield on gold but it kind of drives me a bit mad really and i say to people do you understand what you're saying you know you're saying that there is no yield on gold but there is on cash well actually there isn't a yield on cash in itself. If you put it in the vault, like we do with our client gold, and you stick it there in the dark in a very boring way, there is no yield. All that will happen, as you said, is the purchasing power of that money will decrease over time. And of course, we're putting our gold in the vault, and it's proven that although the price the, com the price of gold goes up and down as confidence in fiat currencies goes up and down and generally down, of course, the purchasing power of gold increases. And I think in my lifetime, the, the pound, the dollar have lost nearly 90% of their purchasing power and uh, of gold purchasing power has gone up by over 500%. But of course, you know, when you put your money in the bank to get a yield, we're putting our pounds and our dollars and our yen at risk. You know, we actually don't have it anymore. It's gone. It's been given to a business. It's been, it's been invested. Um, and of course, you could do that with your gold if you wanted, but you'd cease to have it. So let's compare apples with apples, please. I, I say to people, uh, gold can have a yield if you want. And, 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 and in fact, a number of people offer that. But they've got to be clear. It's your gold has been put at risk to a degree if you do that. And certainly it is with pounds. Um, but, uh, but I mean, businesses as well that might have been uh, looking to sell their business this year. They know they might have, uh, you know, during 2022 thinking, 
actually, I think it's about time to sell our business. We've been doing quite well. Or maybe for, a, for you know, if you're a smaller business, an owner-managed business, it might be a lifestyle, lifestyle change. Uh, some people might have been thinking about, you know, going to for a public market listing. But I mean, obviously, lots, lots of things have changed. You know, the environment's completely changed. What food for thought do you think you could give those business owners, those CEOs, those families that own businesses who are considering, who were considering selling their business and worried about uh, 2023? Well, I think one of the things that's been fascinating in recent years is to see how much value is being created in private equity and companies that are not on the public market. In fact, the the choice of companies to invest in on the public markets has, has reduced significantly over the last decade and a half. And there's a shortage of really good companies coming to market. So um, I think it's a kind of a two pronged answer to that. I think you can, you as we do, obviously, by raising uh, capital for companies, you can grow an awful lot more if you get an injection of capital through private equity you can add a lot of value to a business before you sell it and you're also not so subject to the vagaries of the markets uh if you're a public company obviously when something like this happens we've seen all the bank shares and a lot of financial shares have gone down in sympathy with silicon valley or credit suisse you have none of that when you're a privately held company so there's often a, an attraction to actually take companies private that are currently on the stock stock market. If you're thinking of selling, a lot of it depends on the nature of the company. So tech companies, for example, took a bit of a hammering in 2022. They then started recovering. And then again, the questions are coming back now uh, based on the uh, banking system and the financial system. That's going to challenge some values as well. So timing wise, if you can afford to wait another 12 or 18 months, I suspect it would be better. Um, I think with smaller family-owned businesses, it's it's a harder problem. It, it, what, what you often find is that the, the next generation of the family have seen how hard you've worked to build the business and they don't want to know. So they're, they're off being lawyers or doctors or financial advisors. They don't want to be entrepreneurs. So you can't let them go. You know, we've got the new episode, the new series of Succession starting soon. If anyone's watched that, you know, it's, uh, it's always fascinating to see how family companies deal with uh, passing it across to the next generation but um i think yeah again it's it's really a case of uh, biding your time and, and seeing how things settle down rather than trying to, to to rush a sale and just see how you can add value in these times by being in the right sort of markets and also it's quite surprising you know how much money is held as cash in business bank accounts because we we have a process we call wealth 360 where we we have a, a kind of full analysis analysis of our members' portfolios, where I get together with a regulated IFA, and we look at everything, including their business. And the number of times I'll see a million pounds plus just sitting on the, the balance sheet of a privately held company uh, in some form of cash or cash-like uh, instruments. And again, I, I say to them, look, you know, how much profit did you make last year? They might say, oh, 150,000. I said, well, effectively you made zero because it's you've, you've lost that much in the purchasing power of your cash. So um, I, I believe you're, you're, you're going into the uh, uh, business accounts world as well with Clint, uh, Jason. So one option, I guess, for them will now be to, to go to put some of that cash at least into a, a business account with Clint. Yeah, well, we yeah we definitely got that on our roadmap, and we've even started beta testing with some of our clients who have businesses. So yes, we do have some businesses on the Glint platform, and as you say, they're able to now diversify some of their working capital into gold, but still be able to spend it when they need to, still be able to have access to it because hundred percent of that gold is always there, and we've created that liquidity. But um, it's been fascinating speaking to you, Graham. Or as always, um, you kind of deliver the, the the information in such a great way. Um, thank you very much for spending the time with us and, and giving us your thoughts where can people learn about you and um both at private equity what, what where can they find out more information well, there's quite a bit on the website. It's just BeauftPrivateEquity.com, and you can join us there. We don't charge any fees for membership. You just have to certify that you meet the FCA criteria as a high net worth investor, fill in a bit of uh, paperwork there, and then we can share our, our content with you. You can also find a, a lot of our, our free stuff on our, our YouTube channel. If you just search Graham Rowan Wealth in YouTube, you'll find a lot of videos that we put out there. And uh, yeah, that'll be a great starting point for you. And we do Wealth Week videos videos on the website you can see them on the the news page as well so there's lots of content there to to keep you entertained in these uh, cold winter months 
Thank you. And uh, to everyone listening, uh, I'm going to be doing more of these types of interviews with interesting people like Graham. And if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on any of them, please click the uh, subscribe button below and uh, we make sure you get notified about the next um, Jason uh, meeting uh, interview that we, we have here at Glint. So um, thank you very much, Graham. Thanks a lot, Jason. I really Cheers. enjoyed it. Bye. Thanks. Bye now.